channel. And uh, uh, I'll just Maxi, maybe you you could try to share your screen. Can everyone see actually? Maybe to put it into presentation mode. Yes. Is it okay? Yes, no. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity for me to talk about some of our work. And so today I'll be talking about orbital entanglement and correlation. And this would be a rather elementary and introductory talk so you can sit back and relax, especially to the people in uh, European time. It's a little bit late. <laughs> So we know that entanglement is a very uh, important concept in many, many um, fields of physics. In this uh, home base quantum information community, it's um, considered as a valuable resource uh, with which you can perform quantum information tasks such as teleportation. For example, if Alice and Bob share a pair of maximally entangled qubit, they can teleport an unknown quantum state to each other, which is something very sci-fi like in uh, Star Trek. Um, and in condensed matter physics, uh, is known that entanglement or rather the beha behavior of entanglement can be used as an indicator for physical phenomena such as uh, quantum phase transition or the emergence of topological order. And in the past 20 years or so, uh, there has been a wave of applications of these uh, quantum information theoretical concepts in quantum chemistry. And this is part of the reason why this workshop is taking place, I guess. And here I will uh, show you uh, some uh, examples. The first one being, the automated selection of active space orbitals. We know that um, the complete active space method is a relatively cheaper and very accurate, efficient way to obtain a ground state uh, approximation. But how to choose this uh, active space orbitals um, to perform your full CI calculations on, it's um, rather difficult because it requires a lot of chemical expertise and experience. And can you do it without um, these knowledge, prior knowledge uh, about these molecules. Well, in this paper um, by Christopher Stein and Markus Haya, um, they developed a method to automatically select these um, active space orbitals um, based on the single orbital entanglement as well as mutual information between the orbitals out of a large collections of orbitals. So in this sense that uh, you choose the, mostly, uh, the most correlated orbitals in order to capture the correlation effect in your ground state. And the second example is the Fermi uh, uh, orbital optimization uh, in these kind of quantum chemistry contests. I think Ursh also mentioned this on Monday. Um, so when you apply tensor network uh, methods to quantum chemistry, you have this extra degree of freedom to choose the uh, same molecular orbitals that you map onto your tensor network. And this choice can be optimized. For example, compared to the Hartree-Fock orbitals, the uh, if you run the DMRG on the optimized uh, Hartree-Fock orbitals, then you uh, converge faster. Also, it requires um, less bond dimension, so lower comput uh, computational cost. And also, this is reflected kind of uh, on the level of the mutual information between these orbitals. So if you compare these two graphs, you can see that the mutual information uh, between the optimized Hartree-Fock orbitals is much more uh, concentrated and also uh, much more local compared to the Hartree-Fock orbital basis. And the third example uh, I show here is to show that you can also use these uh, entanglement correlation concept to explore chemical phenomena. For example, in this paper, they use the mutual information between orbitals to monitor the process of bond formation or vice versa, bond breaking. Uh, and what they directly observe is that when you dissociate a diatomic molecule, the, uh, there's a strong correlation that emerges between the bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. So you can see that there are many fruitful applications of these concepts in quantum chemistry. And I'm, I'm sure in the audience, there are many more people that uh, have much more uh, examples uh, than, than here. So I'll wrap up my very brief uh, introduction. So in this talk, I will first um, talk about um, the original concept of correlation entanglement in the quantum information theory community. In the second part, I would then translate these concepts to the setting of fermionic orbitals, and I'll talk about what kind of complication can arise. And in the third part, I will then apply these concepts to concrete systems um, to show you some of our recent work to relate orbital entanglement and uh, chemical bonding. Okay, first, um, 
in the quantum uh, information theory setting, you're talking about two distinct uh, subsystem A and B, uh, which is described by um, an overall quantum state rho AB. And to talk about correlation, a very na uh, natural way to talk about correlation is to talk about the correlation between the measurement outcomes um, of your local measurements. And mathematically speaking, um, actually, can everybody see the, the cursor? Okay. Um, yeah. So mathematically speaking, it's the difference between this uh, the outcome of your joint measurement minus the outcome of your independent measurement here. And this thing is called a correlator. And this correlator is bounded by above, um, not impressively by the norm of these observable that uh, associate with your measurement because you can always uh, normalize them. But more importantly, it's bounded from above by the by this intrinsic property of the uh, your quantum state rho AB, namely the mutual information. And this mutual information is um, the sum of the fundamental entropy of uh, your to reduce states minus the quantum entropy of your total states. And this quantity is then the locally inaccessible information, or in other words, is the information in your quantum state row AB that is not yet contained in uh, your subsystem um, described by row A and row B. And we can rewrite this um, quantity in terms of the relative entropy between your state row AB and it's uh, the uncorrelated version of it, row A tends to row B. And this relative entropy is um, defined like this, and it kind of measures the distinguishability between two states. And it turns out this row A tensor row B is the closest out of all the uh, product states to row AB. And these product states are of the form pi A tensor pi B, and these are exactly the ones that with respect to all local measurements, the correlator is always zero. So we effectively came from this uh, very operational picture and we uh, arrive at this geometric picture here where you define a, like you have a set of quantum states, you have uh, within it a set of uncoordinated states and your um, mutual information is measured as the closest distance from your state row AB to the manifold of the uncoordinated states. And so it's very nice because we can also use this geometric picture to define entanglement and to follow the same kind of uh, logic then we first dis uh, describe the set of zero entanglement states, which, which are the separable states. And they are defined as the states that you can prepare by local operation and classical communication. So what does it mean? Uh, to unpack this, if you only have local operation uh, with Alice and Bob, then they can do their um, low, uh, preparation in their distant lab and without doing anything extra, then the two state they prepare is already uh, in a tensor product structure. But if you allow them to classically communicate with each other, they then they can arrange a probability distribution of these um, product state that they just cooked up. And these are the so-called separable states. And on this picture, then it's all the convex combinations of uh, the original uncorrelated states. So this set is called DSEP. Then following the same line of thought, the en uh, entanglement is then defined as uh, the distance from your state row AB to the uh, closest separable state here, row sigma rho. And because this blue triangle is strictly larger than this uh, black manifold, then the entanglement is always bounded by, uh, from above by the uh, total correlation measured by the mutual information, which is a um, very nice thing to have because the mutual information measures the co total correlation and the entanglement is only uh, a part of this correlation. And in principle, this uh, quantity is very difficult to uh, calculate. And uh, with maybe a lot of symmetry, sometimes you can calculate it analytically. But uh, in a lot of practical cases, we just have to do it numerically. And one thing worth pointing out is that entanglement is not all the quantum correlation there is. Uh, in 2001, Olivier and Zurich, I believe they first um, this, uh, introduced this concept of quantum discord as a measure of quantum correlation. And also Onoa and his colleagues also recently pointed out nicely of this um, phenomena in terms of chemical systems. And he's also giving a contributed talk here. So feel free to check it out. And there are many ways to um, calculate quantum correlation, define quantum correlation, but we choose a way that it actually fits into this um, geometric picture that we have so far. And again, we define a zero quantum correlation states. Um, they are called the classical states. They're written like this. They are um, a convex combinations of states like um, 
pure product states, II, tensor JJ, with an extra condition on these uh, states, namely these I's and J's are then the local orthonormal basis st uh, states. And they have the property that if you perform a local phenomenon uh, measurement uh, with respect to these bases, then you actually leave your states unchanged. So it's classical in the sense that you can find an optimal local measurement such that you can treat it like a, like a classical state. Um, so I uh, highlight this uh, set of states with the, this pink region here. And similarly, we can calculate the quantum correlation again as the uh, relative entropy distance from your state row AB to the closest classical state here. And because this pink region is strictly smaller than the blue triangle, then the quantum correlation is bounded from below by the entanglement. So this directly shows that there, there's more uh, uh, quantum correlation than entanglement. And its counterpart, the classical correlation, is measured as the mutual information of the closest classical state. So you can think of it as uh, is the uh, correlation that is left once you perform um, this optimal measurement on it to strip away all the quantumness. So to this end, we already have a very comprehensive toolbox. Um, we have the total correlation measured by the mutual information. You can uh, separate it into the quantum and classical parts. And in the quantum part, then you have uh, entanglement within it. But before we apply these um, concepts to quantum chemistry, uh, we have a few caveats to discuss. The first one being that correlations in general, no matter quantum or classical, they're all relative concepts, uh, namely depends on what kind of uh, orbital basis you choose. Uh, once you choose your orbital basis, how do you partition them? And also um, what can you do locally on a subset of um, orbitals? Which brings me to um, the other caveat, namely there's a super selection rules at play for fermions, which I will explain now. Okay, so what can go wrong with uh, fermions? Imagine if you have uh, two fermionic modes, you can think of them as um, two qubits where the zeros and ones are um, described by the empty and uh, the filled mode. And we consider the following product state. So you have a zero bit on uh, subsystem A, and also you have um, uh, equal superposition of zero and one on subsystem B. Okay, now I would like to do something locally. I apply this local unitary transformation, FA dagger plus FA. Uh, and because of the anti-commutation between the uh, uh, creation and annihilation operator on subsystem A and B, you will actually introduce an extra phase in subsystem B, which turns it into a negative uh, superposition between zero and one. So I effectively, did something locally on subsystem A and it ended up influence, uh, influencing the state on subsystem B. So in this sense, this anti-communication relation is really in direct contradiction with the notion of local subsystems. And with this kind of influence, you can actually send a superluminal signal, um, which we devised a scheme in um, one of our last papers. So you can check it out at your own time. But of course, in general, uh, you know, in, in, in practice, we cannot do that because um, nature preserves relativity and it prevents um, a coherent superposition between odd and even particle number states. And this is called a parity superselection rules. And what does it mean is, for example, something like the a, uh, FA dagger plus FA, these kind of operators is not allowed by nature. You cannot implement it. And the only uh, uh, operators that you can implement are the ones that preserve the local parities, or in other words, they have to commute with the local parity operator. And to illustrate um, this kind of schematically, uh, you have two sets of uh, operators, one defined on subsystem A and one set defined on subsystem B. And I use this overlap here to uh, signal that there's a part of them that are not commuting with each other. But once you um, focus on the one that are super selected, namely they obey the parity super selection rules, then you avoided this overlap and you ended up with um, two sets of uh, operators that actually commute with each other. And in this sense that then you can properly define a sense of uh, local subsystems and you can with it define correlation entanglement um, like what we did before. And on the level of your quantum states, it means that the measurable part of your quantum states is actually much 
smaller than um, what you originally have, namely all the coherent term between the different parity sectors are then projected out. And only uh, the physical part of your quantum state can, contains the physical part of the correlation entanglement that you can assess with your local operations. Uh, in terms of PSSR, for example, terms like this, um, killing a single electrons would not be allowed, but you can kill or create a pair of electrons. But sometimes due to energetic constraint or otherwise, uh, you cannot even create or kill a pair of electrons, then it will lead to the numbers or selection rules. And this would then require your local op uh, operations to commute with the um, particle number operators as well. Okay, so with these all uh, sorted out, we can uh, actually apply these to chemical systems. Uh, and the general setting is that you have a set of uh, orthonormal molecular orbitals and you arrange them in certain way. For example, you have uh, some Hartree-Fock orbitals, you can arrange them uh, according to their energy. And then you have to find some way to partition them um, for your interest. And the two uh, partition we consider, the first one being uh, I choose an orbital I and um, I talk about the correlation entanglement between orbital I and the rest of the subsystem by referring to the uh, tensor product between the Fox space associated with orbital I and uh, the Fox space on the rest of the subsystem. And in quantum chemistry, we often talk about, talking about um, an overall pure ground state. So the entanglement with respect to this partition actually can be uh, simplified to just the phonemon entropy of the reduced states on orbital I. And this is called a single orbital entanglement. The other one that we can talk about is um, the orbital orbital entanglement. And to do so, we have to first arrive at uh, row IJ, which is the um, reduced density matrix defined on orbital I and J. And by referring to this um, tensor product here, the Fox space between the Fox space on orbital I and the Fox space on orbital J, then you can talk about um, entanglement between the two orbitals as well. And because the reduced state row IJ is uh, most likely mixed, then uh, you have to follow this geometric picture and perform this minimization to get your entanglement. Okay, so what kind of orbitals should we choose? And it, of course, it depends on um, the problem you consider. And here we're talking about pet chemical bonding. So let's first start with a very um, simple example of two electrons in two atomic orbitals and they come together to form a bond. And I assume that they are exactly identical just by kind of reflection symmetry. And we all know that you can form these kind of bonding and anti-bonding orbitals by taking the plus and minus superposition between them. And the bonding orbital would then arrive at a lower energy. And if you don't have any interaction between your electrons, so let's focus on the non-interacting picture first, then the ground state of these two electrons would then correspond to the configuration where both of them sits on the, the bonding orbital here. And what is the entanglement in this state? And well, since it's a chemical bond, actually, we would expect that there's a huge quantumness at play here, and there should be a high level entanglement. It's a matter of how to find it. Um, so the very naive starting point is to think about the atomic orbitals. Um, can we talk about the entanglement between uh, these atomic orbitals? The answer is no, because um, they are not orthogonal to each other. Uh, there's no tensor product between them. And without the tensor product, we cannot talk about correlation or entanglement of any kind. So um, the atomic orbital setting is a no-go. As we saw before, we can perform this kind of rotation of these atomic orbitals to arrive at the Hartree-4 orbitals with the bonding and anti-bonding ones. And here, since they are orthogonal to each other, you can actually form a tensor product, and then you can calculate uh, the entanglement between them. But unfortunately, the entanglement here is then zero because if you write it out as a tensor uh, in this basis, then it's the tensor product state. So it has zero correlation and zero entanglement. But we can actually uh, reverse uh, the transformation and obtain these atomic-like orbitals. So these atomic-like orbitals, by its name, it's like the atomic orbitals. So you have a huge part of it uh, located on one uh, nuclei, on a nuclei, uh, nucleus only with a small fraction on the other, just to compensate for the fact that we need to need them to be uh, orthogonal to each other. And since they're orthogonal, because we came from 
some orthogonal orbitals and we perform a unitary transformation. So there is a tensor product between them. And if you rewrite the ground state here uh, in this basis, you will actually find them uh, it to be the uh, equal superposition of all these uh, different configuration states. Actually, these are all the possible configuration state with two um, electrons. So you arrive at a maximum entanglement of LN4 here. So compared to hartree fock basis and the atomic-like basis, then we actually come from minimum entanglement to maximum entanglement. Okay. Um, so a natural question is, can we relate this entanglement to some kind of bond order? For example, in this definition, a bond order is uh, the occupation number on the bonding orbital minus the occupation number on the anti-bonding orbital and then divided by two. And let's look at um, a family of states if you consider different particle numbers in still in the non-interacting picture, of course, then uh, the ground states are, uh, you, you can just form them by stacking up your electrons. And these states you arrive, so these four configuration states and have the bond order of half, one, half, and zero, okay? And we can perform arbitrary orbital rotation, not just to get the atomic light orbitals, you can do whatever uh, rotation you want. And you can find out what ro uh, the rotation gives you the minimum and maximum entanglement. And it turns out that in the atomic light -like orbitals, you achieve maximum entanglement. And this maximum entanglement is uh, in perfect proportion to the bond order, actually. So you have LN2, 2 times LN2, and LN2 and 0. And of course, the minimum is achieved by the hartree fock orbital itself um, because um, they are just product states in this basis. So what happened when we finally turn on interaction? Um, here we use an example of the ethylene molecule, which is um, a skeleton of these kind of sigma bonds, but um, between the two carbon uh, centers, you have an extra pi bond. And this is the space on which we solve for the ground states. So our setting is um, you consider two pi electrons on two pi orbitals. So the setting is completely the same. Uh, compared to our previous examples, you're just replacing the uh, local atomic orbitals with the kind of PZ orbitals here, and you still have the bonding and anti-bonding orbital um, arranged according to their energy. So the interaction between the two electrons then effectively propels some of the occupations to the anti-bonding orbital. Uh, in this case, about 3% of the occupation is lifted, and this uh, lifted occupation then resulted in uh, a weak correlation, a weak entanglement between these bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. And in this case, PSSR does nothing to the entanglement because you are superposing two states with the, uh, both even local parity. But since there are e uh, different local particle number, then with NSSR, there is no entanglement at all. And we can likewise perform this kind of transformation to get uh, atomic-like orbitals. And here we can directly see uh, these uh, shape of these orbitals. They are, this, is, this is in the concrete example, un uh, unlike the kind of uh, schematic picture that I showed before, that most of the um, electrons are localized on uh, one nuclear center, but part of it is kind of tilted to the other one to make them orthogonal to each other. And if you calculate the entanglement between these orbitals, then you will find it reaches almost, but not quite, 95% of the maximum entanglement. So this, of course, this life, uh, last 5% is kind of um, prohibited by, due to the fact that you have interacting uh, electrons. And another thing you can look at is the PSSR and NSSR entanglement. You can see that both super selection rules takes out part of, but not all of the entanglement. And this really show you um, a, a glimpse into like, there's really a lot of different configuration uh, state at play if you express your quantum state in this spaces. And of course we can discuss uh, much, much larger uh, systems. For example, the first step we take is to extend this system to go to a decapentane molecule. So you can think of it as kind of five copy of the ethylene that we saw before. And again, we are focusing on the um, solving the ground state um, on the pi manifold. So we only consider 10 electrons and 10 pi orbitals in this case. And here I show uh, the single orbital entanglement uh, 
with the DMRG calculation performed on three different choices of uh, orbital bases. The first one being the uh, canonical Hartree-Fock orbitals. So if you look at these orbitals, you can see that they are really, really delocalized over the entire chain. And because of this, it's probably, that's why they have such a good description of the ground state that you have a weak entanglement. And most of the entanglement, it's just uh, uh, kind of concentrated around the uh, Fermi surface, kind of the line between the highest occupied uh, bonding orbital and the lowest occupied anti-bonding orbital here. Okay, and the second choice uh, for us is the PPEC masse localization uh, scheme. It's such a common scheme that we want to kind of compare with um, our method. And if you look at this orbital picture, you can see that these orbitals are not exactly kind of localized on one center, but two centers. And they're localized on exactly the position um, of a pi bond. And you can see that the overall entanglement is even weaker than those of the Hartree Fock ones. And this is precisely because um, they are the local bonding and anti bonding orbitals. And effectively, by, um, they kind of hide the entanglement within themselves. And that's why we don't see much entanglement between these orbitals. But as we go to the atomic like orbitals, you can see um, that they're mostly. Uh, still on one carbon center and sometimes with a little bit of uh, a cloud on another uh, carbon center. And you can see that the uh, single orbital entanglement is extremely high. It's actually very close to um, uh, maximal entanglement. And you can see that it's even translationally variance because these orbitals are more or less translationally invariant to each other. And we can take a closer look at these um, correlation patterns. So here I show the uh, orbital orbital correlation. So these uh, numbers are the orbital uh, index and these lines, uh, according to the color and also the, the, the thickness, they represent the strength of their correlation. So here the total correlation between the Hartree-Fock orbitals are then split into the quantum part and the classical part. And you can see that the classical part really dominate uh, the, the total correlation with the 71%. But when we go to the PM localized orbitals, okay, now the correlation is a little bit uh, more spread out evenly. And, that's, and you even have a kind of weak pairing effect. And this is because, for example, orbital one and two are then the bonding and anti-bonding orbital uh, sitting on the same two carbon centers. And this is kind of a weak correlation effect that we saw previously on the uh, ethylene system. And but you can already see through this kind of Alexi, partial, you have five minutes to go. Uh, there's oh, five yes, minutes I, left. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have the time here also. Thank you. Um, uh, through this partial localization, you already uh, see a decrease in the classic correlation and an increase in the uh, quantum correlation. And it's much more drastic if you go to the atomic like orbital, the change. Um, you have a very, very strong pairing effect. So these are almost maximally correlated um, pairs. And the location of these pairs are exactly the location where the pi bond uh, lies. Because these uh, 1, 2, 3 to 10 are simply, you can think of them as the, even the carbon center index because these uh, orbitals are so localized, they can, they're just identical to the location of the, kind of the, the, um, the carbon center. And you can see that the quantum correlation even surpasses the uh, classical correlation, which is um, quite uncommon in chemical system, actually. And we can look at the entanglement for more detail. Um, the maximum entanglement between these um, orbitals are actually about 91% of the theoretically maximal. Um, and because the entanglement is so strong, it even uh, develops a monogamy uh, effect, namely um, these two carbon center that associate to the same bond, they are in, strongly entangled to each other and only entangled to each other, but not with the rest of the system. And this is very much different than the quantum correlation, because in this picture, they can still be quantumly correlated, quantumly, quantum correlated to uh, other orbitals. So in this sense, uh, it might give a hint that, you know, entanglement might be a better way to characterize um, this kind of bond pairing instead of the quantum correlation or the other uh, correlation quantities.
Okay, so uh, here I can already kind of wrap up a few kind of take home messages. The first one being uh, from the quantum information theory community, we can um, have this amazing toolbox where we can quantify all sorts of uh, correlation quantities, in, uh, including classical quantum and entanglement. And more importantly, you can find a way to fit them all into this geometric picture so that they're all measured by the uh, relative entropy. They're all on the same equal footing. You can easily compare them. And the second take home message is that uh, entanglement and correlations are relative concepts. And we saw this um, very um, obviously in these examples that we saw with the uh, harsh fall orbitals having weak entanglement, also going to the atomic like orbitals having almost maximum entanglement. And we also saw that super selection rules is uh, very important in the setting of fermions and it reduces the accessible entanglement that is stored in your fermionic system. And with our application to the concrete examples, we discovered that through orbital localization, we can recover maximum entanglement, namely of value LN4 in chemical bonds between uh, atomic-like orbitals. But in realistic systems, once you turn on the electron interaction, then this entanglement is weakened. And okay, and lastly, I would like to uh, thank you for your patience and also want to thank uh, our collaborators, Stefan Connect um, from GSI for uh, calculating all these molecular ground states for us, and also Solis Burras from the Wigner Institute uh, for some very helpful discussions. And yeah, here's uh, uh, group photos of us and some publications uh, related to this topic. And yeah, thanks again. And if there's any questions, please uh, go ahead. So thank you very much, Lexing, for this uh, excellent talk. And now it's time for questions. So please raise hand. And Christian has applause. Okay, it's not a question. <laughs> Maybe I have a question that uh, mm. you know we also studied. I had a various studies on on this um, um, about the bond order and and how it's related to to correlations and entanglement. And so you have shown we, there, there's this series of of uh, of this carbon and, and hydrogen series. But what happens with the, with the carbon dimer? So where you have C two because that's an interesting question whether the bond order is three or four and things like that. So do you have a because for the other cases it's, it's more simple. Mm -hmm. But for, for the for the carbon dimer, do you have a um, some finite uh, statement that what is the bond order? Um, I think in order to achieve say uh, higher than one bond order, then we have to go beyond uh, orbital orbital entanglement. So in this case, maybe you have to go to uh, the setting for three orbital versus three orbitals. Then maybe you can describe that. Or if the um, orbitals are kind of separately um, entangle with each other, then you can. Uh, simply discuss them uh, with three pairs and then you kind of add them up. But we haven't tried this, but that's a very nice point. That's actually a very nice direction to go into, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, that would be something. Uh, mm, I think yeah. that would be uh, a good thing to, to try because this is in the literature. There are these, these discussions, and I think it's something. Okay. That... Yeah, that's a very that's a very nice opinion. Thank you. The next question is from Onur. Thank you very much. This nice uh, presentation, Dixon. Uh, actually, I agree uh, with us. I think I think the uh, bond order in the the uh, in, in in this uh, molecule uh, uh, can be a good example uh, for your uh, investigation. And let me ask uh, one question about this uh, long carbon chain. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you can assume a resonance between two different structures, and uh, you only consider one structure here. I think in this particular example, you cannot have a resonance structure. So uh, for example, if you pick only in this direction, then you have five pi oh, bonds, but otherwise oh, you have four. I, but if you go to the, benzene, then you could. And that's a completely different story that I don't have time to go into. Yeah. Then uh, and we can have a, a separate talk if you want to. Yeah, then thanks. Thanks a lot, Dixon. Okay, um, your next question is sure. Hi. Um, hi, this is a very nice talk. And I actually have a question regarding to this uh, atomic like optos. Mm -hmm. Because um, so uh, it seems like there exists a node uh, in the wave function. And if you, in uh, principle, like at least in chemistry. Um, yeah, exactly. It's, um, Can you hear me? Blue, pink page. Oh. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I know what you mean here. Yeah. Yes. There, so there's um, a node. Um, mm -hmm. 
usually it will increase the energy if there's a node in the wave function. Uh, is it also this case or do you see any drawback from this kind of optos? Um, I don't think the, the energy level would be too much of a problem because if you compare to the atomic orbitals, you're just starting out with um, two orbitals with a similar energy. And it depends on how you kind of combine them to lower your energy. And it's exactly the, the same uh, setting here with the uh, additional benefit that they are actually orthogonal to each other and still preserve some of the, uh, most of the locality. So I don't think energy would be too much of a, uh, a problem in this case. Okay. I hope Thanks. that answered your question. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Let me see if there is uh, one more, uh, there's no more questions or maybe there is uh, one minute for, for questions. Honor, uh, it's, it's a plaza or a question, Honor? Uh, let me ask one more question, Dixon. Uh, in the re recent fermionic quantum teleportation uh, scams, there are some claims that there is a relation between the uh, particle entanglements and the uh, numbers super selection rule restricted entanglements. <clears throat> Do you have any comment on this re relation? Oh, sorry, I, I, I'm not fully understanding your question. Could you say it again? Uh, in, in, in some fermionic quantum teleportation scams, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in which the uh, molecules are uh, used, actually uh, they show that uh, there is a relation between the entanglement between the indistinguishable electrons and mm -hmm. the fermionic mode entanglement under the uh, parity numbers by selection rule. There is a connection between these two quantities. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any comment about this? Um, are if you, if I understand it correctly, then uh, I think the super selection rules then kind of reduces the capacity uh, uh, with of the entanglement, and then it lowers the kind of capacity of your quantum teleportation scheme. Right? It, then you cannot, uh, with super selection rule presence, then you cannot um, have a one hundred percent faithful teleportation scheme. It, it would be slightly uh, probabilistic, if. If that's yes, what, but uh, I think here the point is that uh, particle entanglement is another notion. Ah, uh, right, you're talking about particle entanglement, all right. They said that there is a relation uh, with the uh, particle entanglement. This parity number super selection rule uh, actually reduces mode entanglement in such a way that it becomes related with the particle entanglements. Do you have any comment about this? No, but I will have to kind of look into that. Maybe we can have a separate chat about that as well. Thanks. Yeah, but thanks for bringing that up. So um, maybe it's time to, to switch uh, uh, to the next speaker. So let me thank again, Lexin.